Hello and welcome back to the Arcane Forge. My name is Josh and today I wanted to take you back to the Magic Item Workshop. A series of videos, admittedly I get much less time to do than my Monster Mondays, but not unlike my Monster Mondays, this series is one where I talk about magic items and I talk about their lore, their history and what they're like to use and to have in game. Now sometimes I cover magic items that feature in the Dungeon Master's Guide or in some associated books, but today I have decided to make one of my own. You guys really like the last one that I did, the Cryptex of Loki, so I thought I would make another one for you today, and this is admittedly, as a lot of homebrew magic items tend to be, a hideously powerful item. So DMs, if you're going to put this in your game, just make sure to give it a once over, and make sure that you actually want your players having this in game. So let's get started with today's video and talk about the Banshee Talons. So the Banshee Talons are a series of gauntlets, I guess, and a backpack. I call them a wondrous item because they're not strictly a weapon. They have weapon-like abilities, but they're not a weapon. And wondrous item in D&D just means something that you can wear or use, but isn't specifically a piece of armor or a weapon per se. I said that this was a legendary item as well, just to kind of give it the status of something absolutely magnificently huge and powerful and a little bit game-breaking in the wrong hands. And these items have two main inspirations. Firstly, and most obviously, as you will see me going through this, I think I've said on numerous occasions that I'm a huge fan of Blizzard Entertainment. And for the most part, that tends to overlap with D&D in that I get to share with you my love of World of Warcraft. But what few of you will know, some of you pointed out, I think Free From Nuts uh, mentioned in one of my miniature painting videos that I'm wearing an Overwatch hoodie. I'm also an absolutely enormous Overwatch fan. Most nights I get a couple of rounds in, and I'm not good by any stretch of the imagination, but I still love it. I absolutely adore this game. For those of you who are unaware, it's a, it's a first person game. It's a team based player versus player experience where you pick a hero to play or a villain. And each of those heroes have very, very specific abilities. It's all about kind of finding the right team dynamic to accomplish certain goals, like capturing a flag, capturing certain points on the map, escorting a very slow moving payload, things along those lines. Within this game, there are various types of character. Again, as I say, all with wildly different abilities, but a huge amount of lore and character design has gone into the artwork and into how they play. It's a wonderful, wonderful history and in-game lore. But the character that I play most frequently, what's known as a main, a character that I play pretty much all the time that I can get the chance, is an Irish lady called Moira. Moira is what's known as a support character. There are damage dealers, tanks, and support characters that heal usually. And Moira is somewhat of a David Bowie inspired and kind of vampire inspired mad scientist who uses a kind of vampiric health draining ability on one hand and in the other hand she has an ability that heals her allies and her whole deal is that she is a sort of damage dealer and sort of healer supposed to be more on the healing side of things. She's all about balancing a reserve of energy that she gathers from dealing damage to opponents and then can spend on healing allies. I find this mechanic immensely fun. It seems tactical, but also my accuracy in first person shooting games is unbelievably poor. And thankfully she is someone that you don't really need to aim that well with. Her damaging abilities sort of lock onto a target, her healing abilities spray a cone of healing energy. And she also has other abilities, like the ability to teleport, to reposition herself where she needs to be. She's very quick. She can fire these ricocheting spheres, and if aimed in the right place, can heal a whole team or damage a whole team. And she has this sort of ultimate ability where she fires an enormous cannon of energy that both damages enemies and heals allies in this one strict line. So I really wanted to make a kind of fantasy version of this character. I wanted to allow you to be this kind of person in D&D. And I thought it would be a good idea to do this because they're such an iconic character as if they were a character in the game and you are possessing the items that allow them to perform these abilities, which is why this is so powerful because this is essentially giving you a character class or something along those lines in a very minimal way through an item. The other thing that I wanted to cater to when creating these magic items, the Banshee Talons, is the fact that I have found it 
quite difficult to encourage my players personally to choose a healing class. They're quite bored by the concept of being a healer. In fact, very few of them pick tank characters either, uh, so we'll maybe come to that one day. But I've known for a while that I've wanted to translate Overwatch into something D&D, like D&D magic items, and I thought, what a great way to encourage people who aren't that into healing by giving them a great and very fun, very versatile, rewarding magic item that couples damage with healing, or rather encourages people to heal, heal via causing damage to other people. So it still encourages people who are excited about damage dealing, but not necessarily very interested in the healing part, to gather a resource pool of damage that you can then spend on healing. So if you, like me, like to make quite challenging encounters for your players, but none of them like to play healing classes and you don't want a total party kill, then the Banshee Talons might be a good way to allow one of your players to be whatever they want, but also be a side healer. So, why Banshee Talons? Well, as I've mentioned before, Moira, the character that these items are inspired by, is this kind of vampiric, mad scientist. She's Irish, and although not sort of banshee whale or sort of noise based in any capacity, purely because of the whole Irish origins, I felt that an Irish monster, kind of creepy ghost, was a good symbol for Moira. Now I'm actually going to be drawing this character as what I imagine they might be in D&D. So I'm kind of drawing her as a bit of a half elf, like half drow, half high elf. I suppose that makes her a full elf, but hybrid of the two. She's a character all about duality. And her whole deal in game is about the idea that she is a crazy scientist who believes that she's doing good. She believes that ultimately her scientific endeavors are improving the world, but she feels that all of the red tape, all of the human rights laws and so on, really hinder her research. And that the world would be a better place if she had the chance to experiment on anyone in any capacity to provide the best results. She's a very ends justify the means character. Now, obviously what that means to you and me is that she is a bad guy. Regardless of her motives, she's doing bad things. So I thought in the spirit of this, a good intentioned person who is quite okay with evil acts, I said that this wondrous legendary item requires attunement by a chaotic good, a true neutral, chaotic neutral, neutral evil, or chaotic evil character. Whatever it is, they need to avoid the law. They're not into restrictions and red tape, regardless of their motivations. Now, I said that this was a very cumbersome set of items. It's a set of gauntlets, two very, very different materials making these gauntlets, which, with a series of tubes and leather straps, attach to a massive arcane canister on the person's back. Perhaps, as this character is maybe elven, they're very, very slight of build. In fact, you'll see me using the original concept artwork here as reference while I try and make this image. So you can see how gaunt this character is. I thought this device would be incredibly cumbersome and would be fairly obvious as a means of kind of trying to capture the same spirit of the original character, A, in her silhouette, but also in the fact that she herself actually has a very, very low health pool. She seems like she's going to be absolutely unbelievably overpowered because she can deal all this damage and she can heal people as well. You know, what's her downside? Well, it turns out her downside is a lack of armor and a lack of health but she needs to be very nimble in order to dodge and escape. So this is kind of a great item for uh, perhaps a warlock or a rogue, someone who's going to have very high dexterity and be able to dodge out of the way of things, but not necessarily your big tanky cleric that no one really chose to be in the first place, which is why you're using these items in that vein. The first thing that these items allow you to do once you're wearing them is to use an ability called Fade. Moira famously looms into a inky blot of smoke in order to teleport wherever she needs to be. And I thought it was important, seeing as there is a spell exactly like this in D&D, that these items should allow you to cast that. So I said, with the Fade ability, the Banshee Talons allow the wielder to briefly dematerialize into a plume of dark and inky smoke, granting them three uses of the Misty Step spell per day, recharging at dawn. The right hand of the Banshee Talons comprises a series of long claws carved from the teeth of vampires. 
to make sure that the little fingernails here at the end, she has these very iconic long fingernails and I wanted to make sure that every part of this device had some sort of function, a kind of magitech, you know, using magical ingredients in a technological way. You're a scientist after all. So harnessing the power of vampires by claiming their teeth, these items are built. So yes, Banshee Talons comprises a series of long claws carved from the teeth of vampires set into an armature mesh of obsidian ringlets. In the palm of the hand sits a jagged and roughly cut ruby which faintly glows. If a creature has an empty right hand, they may use the vampiric drain ability as a main action. So Moira's main damaging ability is to sap someone of their strength, to absorb their health and store it in their backpack that they that she can then use for other abilities. So essentially, as long as you're not wielding a big heavy weapon in that hand, allowing this ruby free access to be essentially like a spell that you're casting, I have said that you make a ranged weapon attack against one creature that you can see within 30 feet. This drain has a very short range. Now I've said that once you've hit that this Vampiric Drain deals 1d8 plus your Charisma modifier as necrotic damage, as a kind of torrent of necrotic energy drains the life from your opponent. Now you can substitute the Charisma modifier for something else that you feel is more relevant, maybe Dexterity because it's a slight ranged attack, but I felt because this was a spell and it was something that someone didn't really know about, it's not like... Well, it's a ranged spell attack, but it's not something you're intellectually divining. You are draining someone's spirit. It felt like charisma was appropriate. But again, that's up to you as a DM if you're choosing to put this into your game. Either way, it causes a vacuum of necrotic energy, essentially. And in-game, this ability, thankfully for people like me, who are very, very inaccurate in first-person shooters, is a damaging ability that locks onto a target. So long as you can maintain range and maintain your proximity to this person, then this arc just drains them. So I've said on each of your subsequent turns, provided that you maintain con concentration, just like a spell, on the target and remain within 30 feet of this creature, you can continue to deal 1d8 plus your charisma modifier as necrotic damage without having to roll to hit again, maintaining the spirit of this ability in game. Sort of like a very, very depowered witch bolt. It's not a huge amount of damage, your charisma modifier might be quite large and therefore it will scale with level, which is quite nice, but the important part of this move is an HP pool that it drains using this ability. So I've said that ne the necrotic damage that you deal to a creature through vampiric drain is stored in this crystal on their back, this kind of backpack part of the Banshee Talon apparatus. So the damage that you deal directly is absorbed into this backpack. Noticeably, I needed to make sure that this didn't heal players. This isn't something that directly heals a player. This is something that is then sort of ammunition for other abil abilities. So I said that the HP pool, the direct number of damage that you deal, is absorbed, stored in this backpack, and that number of HP that you've stored cannot exceed five times your level in your highest class, if you've multi-class, but five times your level. And that whole pool disappears if you take a rest. So it's designed to be used immediately and efficiently in combat, sort of like inspiration. You won't want to gather too much because it'll disappear eventually, but you'll want to use it as quickly as you get it it has a purpose, an immediate purpose. Now the left hand of the Banshee Talons is the healing apparatus here. So using that HP pool that's been stored, you can then send out a flare, a mist of celestial energy that heals people. I've said that the left hand of the Banshee Talons houses the eye of a unicorn, preserved perfectly within amber. Unlike its sister, this gauntlet is inlaid with delicate gold and mithril patterns. And again, just with the just like the other hand, this ability, this celestial flare, can only be used if this person does not have a weapon in that hand or a shield. They're not holding anything in there. This unicorn eye in the center of their palm needs to be the focus for the celestial flare ability. It needs to be open and visible. The celestial flare ability is another 30 foot range. So again, you have to be very close. You have to be right in the thick of combat ability that allows you to heal a single willing creature and using one action you can deplete some or all of the pool that you've drained into your backpack into this crystal to heal another target not unlike the lay on hands ability basically with a very short range but it's all about give and take you take hp from somebody else and you can use it on one of your allies essentially 
Now, I hadn't designed this to be something that can heal the person wielding this apparatus, but if you choose to put this into your game, then this is something that's up to your discretion. The final two parts of this Moira character that I've mentioned before are these orbs that she can fire that either heal or damage opponents, and this radiant and necrotic beam that she can fire as her ultimate ability. So this orb I've called the Chaotic Orb. I've said that the Banshee Talons, just by the nature of the stuff that's gone into making them, these vampiric teeth that have gone into the talons on the right hand, and the unicorn's eye in the left hand, the magic infused into the ringlets that make up these gauntlets, the magical crystal that stores all of this energy, there's enough built up energy inside this already that it can use they can produce some healing and damaging abilities if you're in a pinch, if you can't drain somebody and then expend that healing power. So I've said you get one use of Chaotic Orb, which recharges after a long rest. And basically you fire a five foot sphere of either necrotic or radiant energy, you get to choose at the moment of release, but your use of ability you have to pick one or the other. You don't get to use both between rests, if that makes sense. And this orb travels a distance of 90 feet in a straight line away from you. But then, to keep in spirit of the game, it bounces in a random direction whenever it hits a surface, and continues in a straight line from there, moving a total of 90 feet. So you might want to have something on your board that signifies where this orb is. Now, a lot of different DMs have different mechanics for how something will move in a, quote, random direction, but I've suggested here that you roll a d4, a result of 1 would be north, 2 would be south, 3 would be west, and 4 would be east once it hits something. And it repeats this bouncing effect every time it encounters another surface, but it doesn't count creatures as surfaces. This is just energy and creatures in this path absorb some of its power. I've said that creatures that are within 30 foot of this orb as it travels receive either the healing or the damaging effects of it, unless you choose to banish the orb. If you choose the radiant orb, creatures within the aura at the moment of banishment regain 2d6 plus your charisma modifier as HP. Again, you can choose something different from charisma modifier, it just seemed fitting. And if you choose the necrotic orb, when you banish it, any time along its path, creatures get a chance to dodge out of the way using a dexterity saving throw. I've said DC 15, but again, you can change that based on how powerful you think this ability is, or what level your players and their opponents might be. Either way, they get to make a dexterity saving throw, and creatures within that 30 foot radius can take 5d6 plus your charisma modifier as necrotic damage on a failed attempt, or half as much if they pass your dexterity saving throw. So a very powerful move for both damage and healing, but most useful if you can get a cluster of enemies or allies in one spot. And again, you need to be wary of what surface you're throwing this towards. Now finally, I have said that coalescence is the ultimate ability. It is Moira's ultimate in-game, and because it's so worryingly potent, I thought that Specific requirements need to be met in order for you to gain this ability. In Overwatch, characters have ultimate abilities that they gain charge in over time, and they gain more charge if they are using their other abilities effectively. So again, maintaining the spirit of the game, I felt like it would be a good idea if you had to use your abilities effectively in order to gain the ability to perform the coalescence move, adding a layer of skill to this item. So I've said that if you score a critical hit while using Vampiric Drain, if a creature is killed while you use Vampiric Drain on it, or if a creature is killed via the Chaotic Orb ability, then the Banshee Talons, and subsequently the person using them, gain one charge of Coalescence. And these charges, unlike the charges for all of the other abilities, stick with you. But only three charges of Coalescence can be held at any time. And importantly, there's no way, other than the above the aforementioned criteria to regenerate these charges of coalescence. You don't start with any. A single charge of coalescence can be used to perform the coalescence ability, which is a beam of searing energy laced with spirals of shadow to form a 100 foot long, 5 foot wide beam. Mod modeled very much on the lightning bolt spell, I said the enemies need to make a DC 15 dexterity saving throw. Creatures in that path take 68 plus your charisma modifier as necrotic damage on a failed save or half as much on a success, and up to five allies in this path receive 48 plus your charisma modifier as healing instead. So that to me seemed like a really fitting way to turn Moira into an item that you can use in game. You can have this in addition to your other abilities as a character. Maybe this would have been more useful as a kind of vampiric class, but I felt like this was a really useful way to 
use her invention, she's a scientist, she uses this apparatus herself in game in a nice magical way to flavour the whole idea. So I hope you enjoyed this venture into the magic item workshop. I really, really loved it. And I really hope to get the chance to make more Overwatch and well other pop culture and gaming inspired magic items for you. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more of this kind of stuff, please make sure to let me know down in the comment section. Maybe you have some suggestions for magic items that you'd like to see me make. In the meantime, if you want to get a hold of these yourself, as I said earlier, or as I should have said earlier, I've left a link in the description box where you can find all of my homebrew and you should be able to find the Banshee Talons to put in your game. But if you enjoyed this video, and I hope you did, I hope you'll leave a like, a little thumbs up down below, perhaps favourite this to refer back to it, and share it with other members of your group, maybe your DM if you're desperate to play as Moira, let them know that you'd really like to use these items, or any communities that you might be a part of that might enjoy seeing something like this. Anything you can do to help like that is really amazing. So thank you very, very much. Otherwise, if you'd like a copy of this illustration or all of the illustrations that I draw each month, if you'd like access to private live streams, one-on-one -on -one chats and other goodies, and you'd like to support the channel in a really personal way, I'd urge you to head over to my Patreon page where backers get all sorts of wonderful gifts and thank yous and we get to build a little community together. So thank you very much if you choose to do that. If you're looking for Monster Mondays, hopefully I'll be back with those fairly soon, but as it is, I'm just away on my honeymoon at the moment. But until next Monday, I hope you have a fantastic week, and I will see you next time. Yeah.